Well, hi guys. Um, you have sent me in a bunch of questions here on Twitter and um, I'm just gonna go through them and give you the most honest answer I can. When did you first conceive of the idea of Avatar? What was your inspiration? Um, well, I'd say the very first seed of Avatar was a dream I had when I was in college. I was 19 and I had a dream about a, uh, an amazing forest that was bioluminescent and I got up uh, afterwards, I was so inspired by the dream, I started sketching it in oil pastel, colored pencils and so on. And years later, I started to incorporate that concept into a story. It wasn't Avatar, it was another story. And then years after that, uh, in, um, let's see, 95, um, I, I was looking to tell a story that took place on another planet uh, that I could uh, develop to um, my newly founded visual effects facility called Digital Domain. And so uh, I incorporated it, I incorporated that concept into a thing I called Avatar. Um, uh, so, you know, in terms of inspiration, there was that, there was every piece of nature photography I've ever seen, every moment that I've spent in a forest up in Canada where I grew up catching, you know, frogs and snakes and that sort of thing, just, you know, wanting to be kind of one with the forest, which I did naturally as a, as a kid, I loved it. Um, my time underwater, you know, as a scuba diver, hundreds of hours all over the world, seeing amazing colors and reef fish and, and various animals that got those colors and those um, creatures got incorporated into some of the plants and animals of Pandora, or just made them really big, as opposed to the little tiny ones you'd see on a reef. So the inspiration came from really all over the place my whole life. It also came from my sense of uh, a strong sense of outrage and injustice about what was happening to the natural world, what was happening to indigenous cultures around the world, what had happened to them historically during the colonial period, my concern about the state of the world and the state of nature and of our sort of cultural disconnect from nature. So, you know, there were a lot of things I wanted to say with the film. And, you know, you feed that all, you melt, melt that all down in one big pot and you stir it, what comes out is Avatar. After first writing Avatar, why did you wait 10 years to start making the movie? Well, I first uh, wrote the story in 1995. I got a little funding from uh, my studio at the time, 20th Century Fox, and I said, let's develop this. I had this uh, uh, visual effects company that I had co-founded with Stan Winston, the famous uh, uh, creature creator uh, called Digital Domain. And uh, you know, I wanted to do something really big and I wanted it to be cutting edge and I wanted it to incorporate uh, CGI, CG animation, and uh, I had kind of been one of the pioneers with that, with The Abyss and then with Terminator 2. Stan had done Jurassic Park. We now saw that, in a sense, almost anything was possible or, or could be made to be possible. So we wanted to do something so big that it would really push things. And when I brought it in and I, sub uh, I, I let my guys at Digital Domain break it down, say, all right, what can we do? What tools do we need to develop to do this? They said, you're basically out of your mind. Uh, we're not going to be ready to do this for years. So I thought, all right, well, let's just wait. Let's just, we'll just progress the tools. We'll work on some other things. I wound up doing Titanic, and then I wound up doing a number of uh, deep ocean expeditions. I really got into that world for years and years, and I went back to it in 2005. Um, I was going to do Battle Angel, but I didn't like the, the script that had just come in to me from the writer at that time. Uh, she eventually did a fantastic script uh, after that, but at the time, um, I thought, well, what else do I have? So I, I opened a drawer. This is now 10 years after I'd first written this story. And, you know, sitting in there with a, a pile of other, you know, unproduced stuff that I had written uh, was the Avatar treatment, you know, 100-ish pages long, very complete. I sat down, read it in one sitting, and I thought, we should do this movie. The time is right. I had seen enough great examples of character facial animation done with CG most notably King Kong and Gollum, uh, which Peter Jackson had, had really kind of pushed his, his team to break through in that, but there was also uh, um, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean and other examples out there. I thought, I think the time is right to revisit this. We'll still have to push it farther than it's ever been pushed, but I think the time is right to take a look at this. So uh, you know, I went to uh, 20th Century Fox and said, I'd like to do this next. Let's start developing it, and they said, okay. So that's what took 10 years. After that, we were, we were pretty much on a fast track the second I made that decision. So made that decision in 05. Still took 
three and a half years to make make the movie. But you know, kind of a year and a half of that was writing the script and designing the world and developing all the the tools and the technology that we needed to make the film. Let's see what else we got. As this was such uncharted territory, what was it like pitching this idea to the studio? Well, you know, you can imagine that the, the studio was was leery about the, the complexity of this. You know, it, it was a sort of a two-part process because initially in 90, 95 or 96, I said, let's develop this. I came back to them and said, we can't go forward with this. There, there, there's too much of a gap between uh, the current technological capability and what we need to do. When I went back to them in, in 05, I said, we're going to need some money to do a proof of concept that the tools really exist to do exactly what we want to do, which is essentially photographically real looking humanoid characters with full emotion, full speech, correct eyes, correct lips, all of that sort of thing. So we did a thing uh, that was a, a kind of proof of concept reel. It was only a couple of minutes long. So I said, uh, all right guys, I need you to put up $10 million to prove we can make this movie. And they said, basically, are you nuts? I said, look, it's either that or you're going to green light a $200 million movie and not know whether we can do it or not. So what would you prefer? They said, here's $10 million. So a lot of that was just to develop the infrastructure, develop the technique, the, the, the software. We came up with the idea of facial performance capture using a camera on a boom, a single camera, uh, and capturing the body performance in a way that was already being done with, with, with markered suits and so on. The facial camera allowed us to expand the volume about 10 times beyond what it had ever been before. We could bring in horses and gallop them around and do long walk and talk scenes and running scenes and all sorts of things that were never possible before. But it was image-based facial performance capture. It had never been done. And we had to take it through all the way through the steps to a finished image in 3D. So we, we developed a scene that was about a, I think it was like a minute and a half long. We showed it to the, to the, uh, to the studio it wasn't our final cast, it wasn't our final script, it was just an example scene. We learned so much from doing that about how it really works to do this crazy stuff. But we proved we could do it, and we proved that the final image was compelling and powerful. Um, so at that point, the studio said, let's go for it. So then I wrote the script, and we developed the world and the characters, the creatures, and all that sort of thing, and the, kind of in the normal manner. It took us about a year just to bring it all to life through the artwork and, and so on, get it cast and, and get into it. How did you convince the cast to do characters that were done with performance capture? I think by the time we, we cast our, our, uh, our characters and we, you know, I, met, I met Zoe and Sam and, and, uh, and so on, we'd also gone so far down the path that we were able to show them how it worked. We'd already been doing a lot of capture with our, with our troupe of actors that played kind of background characters and they allowed us to do all our, our testing and what we call scouting where we will have a set and then we'll put some actors in the set and sort of roughly play out the scene so that we make sure it, it's all gonna work and so we can adjust the production design. And so there was something to show them. And you know, they, they never really questioned us. I mean, they thought it was strange but they got used to it right away. I would say it's about one day to get used to, to wearing you know, a helmet with a, with a video camera right here that's staring you in the face all day long. But it, you know, ultimately that goes away in their minds. They're acting actor to actor. It's really, as long as they've got another actor there to work with, they're fine because it's about the emotion, it's about the drama of the scene. And they were fine. It, it didn't really take much convincing at all. We just had to explain it to them and then they had to try it. And then they saw that it was basically pretty easy. I think the adjustment was most actors that, that work in the film business are naturally are, are used to doing camera coverage. So you shoot a wide shot, you do a few takes, and then you shoot the two shot, and the over the shoulders, and the close ups. People will wind up, if you do even a modest number of takes, let's say five takes of six setups, you know, between the master, the, the, the closer group shot, the pair of overs, and, and, uh, and set of close ups, and so on they might wind up doing the, the scene over and over and over 25, 30, 35 times. That's not how performance capture works. Yeah, sure, you might, do, you might do a scene six or eight or 10 times, but every time can be completely different. 
And once you have the performance, once you have the, the dramatic take on the scene that you like, then all of that coverage, the close-up and the two-shot, the over-the-shoulder, the wide shot, and the establishing shot, and the helicopter shot, um, are all done later. That's all done later in the, in the virtual camera coverage. It's not done the day of the work with the actors. And once they figured that out, they realized that, wow, this is kind of like creative acting unchained. We could be three or four takes in and completely change the staging because we didn't have to match a master or, or anything else. We could just have fun. We could just create. It was a big sandbox. And once they figured that out, they loved it. And we've found that, that actors love this process and they love the kind of the family feeling of, of working on the capture stage because you're not bouncing all over the place. You, you, bring, you bring that fantasy world of Pandora to you and you create it in our, in our volume, our big um, you know, the stage that we call the volume. And whether it's the ocean or the mountains or the jungle or wherever we are, we create it in that stage. So we're just all there every day working, creating, you know, thinking, feeling, being, the, you know, being authentic. And they love it. And uh, it's almost addictive in a way because, you know, it's a long process. It's kind of like, it's kind of like working on a, a long running TV series that just never comes to air. You know, it's a, it's a weird feeling because it's like, oh yeah, we still have a year and a half to go on this. But anyway, they, they seem to love the process. Um, uh, when I wrote Grace Augustine, um, did I already have Sigourney Weaver in mind for the part? No. Not specifically. Um, in fact, Sigourney's character, Grace Augustine, was ultimately, one, the script came out too long and I had to synthesize it down. And Grace was a relatively minor character and there was another male scientist who ran the Avatar program. And what I did was at the last second, and we were already into casting at this point, um, I synthesized uh, those two characters down to one character and made that character Grace Augustine. And... Um, and then it just hit me. Well, Sigourney would be perfect for this. Um, but the character already, uh, character already existed. I didn't build it around her. But once it, once it struck me that she was perfect for the role, um, it, it was like a phone call. I said, Sig, I, I got a script here. I got a character I hope you'll consider. I'm going to send it to you right away. And she called me back the second she read it. She was very enthusiastic about it. So, you know, kind of the rest is history. It happened pretty fast. Um, so... Uh, and it fit her. It fit her like a glove, but it wasn't tailored for her. In fact, I don't think I even changed a changed a line of dialogue for Sigourney. Um, you know, we uh, we had fun. You know, kind of figuring out what she looked like. We came up with the red hair and the freckles, just a very different look for her. And uh, you know, but the smoking was in the script and everything. Um, yeah, that was just a case of uh, of it was staring me in the face, and I hadn't thought of it. Um, what was the most difficult part in Avatar to cast? Oh, I think hands down that would have been Jake. Um, Zoe came to us very early on. She was uh, brought to my attention by our casting director from Titanic, uh, who unfortunately couldn't complete the show because she, uh, she was sick at the time. Um, but she, her great gift to Avatar was finding Zoe. And uh, the second I met Zoe, I mean, I, I read her, I had her audition and so on, but... But uh, the second I saw her, there, there, there was never another choice. So she was actually, I think, the first actor that we cast. And it was great to have her aboard because then she could read with an audition with uh, our, many of our Jake choices. And I looked at a lot of people for Jake. And it was, it was finding somebody that, was, uh, that could combine the, the young, open-eyed, enthusiastic curiosity of the character, but also the hardened veteran uh, without playing him too bitter, uh, but just worldly, but at a young enough age, and a, a guy that could make that speech, what I call the St. Crispin's Day speech, when he says, you know, ride with me, my, my brothers, my sisters, ride, you know, um, and get the other clans to come along and all that. And he kind of rouses up the Navi and takes them to war. A lot of these young actors, up-and-coming guys that are stars now, and I mean big-time movie stars now, read that speech and it, it didn't make me want to go jump on a banshee and fly with him into hell. And when Sam did it, I just got cold chills down my back and I said, this guy I would follow. He made me believe. And, you know, while there were a number of other actors and you'd know their names, 
that did really well on the other scenes and we were really torn, it was that scene that, that made the difference and tipped us toward, toward Sam. And the thing that was holding me back on Sam was that, you know, his accent was about as thick as Crocodile Dundee's at the time. And so it was a leap of faith that we could get him with an accent coach because uh, I didn't want to play the character as Australian. It was just, it was too specific. It was too regional. I wanted it to, to be more generic. He was supposed to have been American. I think there's something in my subconscious about, you know, kind of the, the colonialism, the conquest of the new world, the U.S., Canada, South America. I wanted him to be American. I wanted him to represent that. Um, so he did a, he wound up doing a kind of a neutral American accent that, you know, he struggled with at first, but then Eventually, he got it dialed in, and he did a spectacular job in the part. Uh, what was the easiest piece of casting? Well, I'd have to say, once the idea popped into my mind, it was Sigourney Weaver. It was one phone call. I never saw anybody else for, for Grace. Uh, we just sort of developed that character together. Um, another one that was, was dead easy was, was Stephen Lang as, as Colonel Miles Quaritch. He came in. He read once. I saw him bring the character to life in front of my eyes, and I think we set him that day. Uh, it wasn't a huge search. I mean, I looked through a lot of headshots and that sort of thing, but he was, he's a guy that I had remembered. He came in an audition for, for Aliens back in uh, 1985 as a young actor, and I, I remembered him from then. And when he, uh, when he came in, he just nailed it, and he looked the part, and, and uh, you know, so that was a pretty easy piece of casting. Another one that was relatively easy was Giovanni Ribisi. Giovanni came in, he nailed it, one read, I saw the character come to life in front of my eyes. Now, I had looked at a lot of ideas, and I had seen a few people, but Giovanni just, just popped. And he's amazing in the new films as well. Uh, they all are, by the way. Uh, you're making all of your movies in 3D. Why is 3D important to you? Well, count the number of eyes in my face. There's two of them, and you've got two, and, and all God's chillin' got two, and pretty much every animal, every insect's got at least two, every fish has got two. We experience the world through a stereoscopic system, a visual system, and when you see stereo, uh, it gives you an enhanced sense. It triggers little regions in the brain that make you feel like you're really there. Well, what do we want to do with a movie like Avatar or the or the sequels? We want to take you to Pandora. We want you to live it, breathe it, um, feel that for that moment, for that period of time, those hours that you're in the dark theater, that this is a real place and you're going on a real journey. And this helps with that, uh, I think. Uh, 3D done well. I mean, there have been a lot of films that have kind of phoned it in and done post-conversion and all that, and I think they've kind of polluted the waters around 3D and, and audience interest has waned. However, I think that, uh, you know, when we come, you know, Avatar is associated with 3D done right, 3D done totally immersively. I think when we come back with the sequels, hopefully, at least, um, that people will realize, all right, here's an opportunity to go to the cinema and have the full experience. Not 90%, about 100%. And frankly, I don't care if it, if it kicks off a new revolution in 3D or, or if it doesn't, as long as people associate Avatar with the best possible cinema experience and Avatar 2 and Avatar 3, then I'm fine. Everybody else can just do what they want. Um, what is your favorite part of Pandora and why? Mm. Tough call. The floating mountains are great. I could fly around in the floating mountains all day long. And of course, we bring those back in the new films. Um, they're just gorgeous. They're just, it's just a transporting kind of very surreal image. And flying around there with the uh, with the banshees, with the akron, which the uh, navi can domesticate, that's fantastic. But I also have a special place for the for the forest at night. Now the forest was great to create, and we made a decision to make it green, not some not purple, not cyan, some strange color, by day, because we wanted the audience to feel grounded. We didn't want the CG to look too much like CG. We wanted it to look like a reality. And then the forest comes to light t comes to life at night with the bioluminescence, then it becomes really otherworldly and dreamlike. And it takes me, loops me back to that dream that I had when I was, uh, when I was 18, 19 years old. And, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, I call it dreaming with your eyes wide open. And that's what we wanted to create with Avatar. So that's why. Uh, what's the one thing about Pandora that you 
would have wished got more screen time but couldn't make it because of the time constraint. Yeah, well, we, you know, we probably could have made the film longer. Uh, we were a little concerned that no one had ever made a 3D movie that was more than an hour and a half long uh, by the time Avatar came out, and we were two and a half plus. So we kind of didn't want to push our luck too much with people wearing glasses on their nose for too long. Turns out now they're perfectly happy if it was longer, and we even released a longer version. So I think we've proven that, that if people are into a movie, they forget the damn glasses are there, and they just go for the ride. But we had a kind of self-imposed limit on ourselves. And there's also, there's also a point at which a movie has the right pace, the right, the right narrative, narrative pace. So we did wind up taking out some things that we really liked. Um, one scene in particular we almost finished. We went right through the whole process, and it's at the end of the film, which is the death of Tsute, uh, Laz Alonzo's character. And it's quite an emotional scene. It's a beautiful scene. Um, we took that out, once again, to just... Let, let the film close with a strong finish. Um, and it sort of got in the way. It was a stumble step that we took it out. But we put it back in the movie and it played beautifully when we re-released the film. Um, you know, I would, have, I would have loved to have spent more time in the forest at night. I would have loved to have spent more time in the, in the floating mountains. But ultimately, I have no misgivings about the final release cut of the movie. Uh, there are little bits and pieces here and there that I would have would have liked to have seen, but I, I think it plays I think it plays well. Um, what is your best advice to the new generations of filmmakers to get noticed in the film industry? Well, look, that was a tough problem when I broke in, and it's a tough problem now. It, it's just the rules are different now, um, so I have to speak in generalities that I think are always going to be true, probably true a thousand years from now. One is you got to you got to know your craft you got to really know your craft you got to really know film and not just the history of film and and be a cineast and know every reference um you know every film noir and every musical and every western and all that it's not about that it's about know the craft know what the dolly grip does know what a lens is know how light behaves because whether it's film or whether it's digital or whether it's something else holographic in the future there are aesthetics that need to be understood so i would say study art and study writing because you've got to know narrative and you've got to know image creation and you've got to know the technology and you've got to be on sets you've got to roll your sleeve up and, and be on sets and and just do the work put in the hours um, you know, I'm not crazy about people who have sat behind a writing desk their whole life and then they suddenly think they're, they're a film director. You've got to be on sets and you've got to know what it takes. And you've got to know what's going to happen when it starts to rain or when the sun's going down and you've got to pick up the pace and all those things that just become the rhythm of life on a movie set. So study film, but don't become a slave to other people's films. That's the other thing I would say. Don't make movies about movies. Uh, I see a lot of that, and sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's entertaining, but it's, it, it never feels authentic to me. You're just, all your reference points are too obvious. Don't make movies about movies. Make, make a movie that's inspired by things you've seen in other movies, but don't go too far with that. Make it something that's authentic, that's coming from your life, your life experience. And that doesn't mean you can't do science fiction or crazy things that, that take place in other times or other parts of the world, um, but... It's got to be something that's, that's unique to you, that's unique to your personality, your worldview, your artistic eye, your lens, so to speak. Um, and you know, don't do it in the service of other, other people's vision. So I would say those three things are, are critical. Ten years later, um, why do you think Avatar continues to have lasting resonance around the world? Well, you know, Avatar has, it doesn't have a, a constant kind of life force in the zeitgeist the way, say, Star Wars does, which is constantly being replenished by new movies. But Avatar does have, uh, you know, a, a beautiful and immersive land that was created at, at Disney in, in Animal Kingdom, uh, Pandora, the world of Avatar. And so, and we know from the success of that and the, and the, the multi-hour long lines to get into the ride attractions and so on that people still love this world and they're anxious to go back. Um, why does it, why did it resonate? It resonates now because it resonated when it first came out. So why did it, why did it resonate when it first came out in all the cultures around the world? Uh, everywhere we released the film, it, it was number one. 
So, you know, it, it was operating across every kind of cultural boundary because I think it was about certain universals of human experience. Um, some of it is that childlike wonder that you have when you're younger and you're more connected to nature and more connected to your dreams and to fantasy. It connected that way, and it didn't matter if you were in China or, or you know, France or South America. I think it connected us to that state when we're, when we're young, where nature is kind of a living, breathing thing around us and we want to be part of it. And we lose that as we grow up, as we go off to a city to be educated or we go off to a city to get a job or maybe we were born and raised in a city and we never really had it, but we yearn for it. I think we collectively as human beings yearn for that. I call it nature deficit disorder. I think we all suffer from it to some degree or another, um, unless you're living in a log cabin you know, up in the Pacific Northwest or something like that, um, or you're actually a truly indigenous person, you know, living in a, in a, in a thatched village in, in the Amazon basin or something. I think we all suffer from that in our technological world. And Avatar takes us to an imagined state of being where we're closer to the, to the natural cycle of life and are more connected, connected to nature, connected to each other. I mean, Avatar is all about connectivity. It's also all about not the kind of digital connectivity that we have, but, but true connectivity. And it's also all about belonging, about finding that place where you belong, that family, that, that love, that uh, thing worth fighting for, and then earning your place there. As Jake Sully, who's an outsider, who's an alien, they call him an alien, he comes in, he strives hard, he falls in love. You know, as he says in the movie, I fell in love with the forest, with the people, and with you. I don't think he lists her third uh, necessarily because she's third, third in importance. I think she's first in importance, she being Neytiri. But she's third because that's the order that it took place for him. He fell in love with the world. It drew him in. He fell in love with the customs and traditions and, and truth and spirituality of the people. And he fell in love with her, and she was his portal into that world, his guide, his spirit guide. So it's about belonging. So you add all these things up, and the movie is working on the consciousness of the, of the viewer, of the audience member, in a lot of subtle ways, and, um, and some that aren't so subtle. Uh, but it, it connects. It connects with, with you, and everybody feels it. Not everybody, obviously. There are pundits. There are, you, no movie can please everybody, but enough people. Anyway, that's my explanation. That's my armchair psychoanalytics around the movie. That's it. That's what I got. That's 11, that's 11 questions. If you got any more, send them in. Always happy to talk about Avatar. Enjoy the 10th anniversary. Thanks. <laughs>